we need to go on and we need to uh, stick to the timetable. At least I think, always think that that's important. Uh, and we want to solve another problem and jump a bit in topic actually. So going more back to traditional economics and not reforming the social system, but doing something potentially more important uh, to save Greece the third or the fourth time actually. Uh, and everybody is complaining about Greece, I guess. Well, not so much in Switzerland, but at least in Germany. Uh, but perhaps Athens could be seen as a model. And we have, uh, hopefully, I think, a very nice presentation by uh, Nick uh, Theodoropoulos, who is from Athens, uh, who is from, from Greece. Uh, and as plurality always met us, he didn't prepare the uh, the presentation himself, but there was uh, another Greek student from the law school uh, in Greece. Uh, it was uh, Stavroula Anton Antigoni Prilli. And as it's always good to control the Greeks at least a little bit with somebody who is also responsible or some responsible nation, there was uh, a Swede in the group too, Marcus Nieberg Andersen, uh, who checked that we remain within the limits, of course. Uh, but it's presented by Nick, and we are really looking forward how you will save your country and Europe. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm here today to share with you our idea about the future of Europe, and more specifically, Greece. It's true that political and economic problems persist in Europe after six years of crisis. And uh, we think that the best case study to examine Europe's problem is Greece. One could ask why, why Greece? Because Greece is one of the oldest members uh, in uh, European Union, one of the more integrated, also a member of Eurozone, and uh, one of the more dysfunctional in modern Europe. So, Let's have a look at the significant system-related problems of Europe and the case study, Greece. What are the factors that undermine economic progress in Greece? First one, inflexible labor market. Labor market is not a uh, well function. Uh, it's very difficult to fire in Greece. It's very costly for businesses. If you work for eight years, it will cost for a business a lot to fire. So we know that when it's very difficult to fire, it's also difficult to hire as well. Just is not very efficient. It is very, very slow. Let me tell you an example. Recently, we have a, a case with a trial that was postponed for the 10 of March, 9 o'clock, of 2031. So at least Greek judges like to be accurate. Uh, but if we think it seriously, we have two parties and they have a dispute. Until the end of this case, maybe one of them or one of the witnesses is not still alive. So how can a Western democracy, a real economy, can work with so slow justice? It's difficult and time consuming to do business. It costs money, you need patience, and you need a lot of time. And uh, the strange is that Greece belongs in a neighborhood with Bulgaria, Firum, that have the opportunity, they give the opportunity to people to open a business and to run a business just in a few days, and with much less taxes than Greece. So, this is a very, very important uh, problem because it's difficult to attract investments. Fourth one, closed markets and irresponsible trade unions. Markets and certain professions are very well protected. Taxi drivers, truck drivers, pharmacy employees. So this increases the cost for the average citizen in Greece. The thing is that, why we say irresponsible trade unions? Because imagine that uh, in Greece, in 2010, if I remember right, we had 
20 general strikes in a year. While in Brazil, a country which has half the average income of, of Greece, they did one general strike in 20 years. So the comparison is chaotic. Big state, huge public sector. We have heard about it a lot of times. The problem is not only that. It's not the size. It's that it's not efficient. And we will discuss about the reasons later. Tax system inefficient, huge black market, and uh, tax evasion. The only people who pay taxes, all the taxes in Greece, are the people who cannot avoid them. Current account deficit continuously every year. Greece is not competitive, and this is strange because it has a very well-educated workforce, a strong tourism industry, and the biggest navy in the world in shipping. But if you look at the previous factors, it's not difficult to guess why Greece is not competitive. Now we'll see how the political institutions affect Greece. Too much bureaucracy. Greeks lose hundreds of hours per year to deal with simple tasks like paying some taxes because use of internet for uh, dealing with the state is not very common. Inefficient public sector. Unqualified and unskilled. So one could ask, what's the difference between unqualified and unskilled? What we mean by unqualified is that a person doesn't have, shouldn't be in the public workforce. Maybe a lot of them haven't attended even you know, high school. By unskilled, we mean that a person should not have a specific position in the public workforce. So, for example, we have four directors to choose one of them, and we choose the worst. In most cases, the one has better you know, political connections. Corruption and clientelism. Uh, after the fall of the dictatorship in the 70s, Greeks were fueled with the idea that clientelism is not something bad. And uh, that cor corruption is something that they should show some tolerance. Uh, but this was a very bad phenomenon to happen. Before the crisis, the best Greeks were going to work in the uh, private sector. The worst were going to work in the public sector. So nobody cared too much. Uh, but after, I forgot to say that in order to go to the public workforce, you needed to know someone, to have some relative to help you, to have political connections most of the time. So after the crisis, it was strange to see that you had PhD students working in bars and cafeterias, and you could see an employee in the public workforce who has not even been you know, in high school taking 2,000 euros as a salary. This was not something normal to happen. Uh, for me, the worst of this phenomenon is that the younger generations lost their motive you know, for success because they thought, hey, what's the point of trying to work hard, trying to get a degree, trying to get good grades, trying to improve, to learn a new language, learn new skills, if in the end it's not the best who gets the job, but it's the person who has the better connections. So for me, a society losing its motivation for success and hard work is something very bad, you know? This was the disaster. And in the end, younger generations lost some faith to meritocracy, justice, and some of them to democracy too. <coughs> Constitution is very inflexible in Greece and in other European countries, but outside Greece, not a lot of people know that Right now we have capital controls, we had the referendum, we had a third bailout, we have Tsipras as prime minister. Uh, 
because of the lack of flexibility that the Constitution had. Why is that? A year before, the leader of the opposition, Alexis Tsipras, took advantage of the Constitution, which required an increased majority to elect a new president. It's not an important role in politics of Greece. Uh, so he caused elections, he became prime minister, you know the rest of the story. Right at the time, exactly the time that Greece was growing, succeeding all the fiscal targets. So to finish this, we need a more flexible constitution, a more functional. Abuse of power. Political scientists in Greece say that the prime minister is a little emperor in Greece, and he has a lot of powers, also the ministers, for even a simple decision to be made, the more simple one, the signature of a minister is required. All these problems, we think that they have, they are linked to a certain extent to too much centralization of political power in Europe and especially in Greece, but it's the case study. What's the solution? We thought that the best would be a combination of the right mix of decentralized and centralized policy making, like in ancient Greece, ancient Greek city-states. And we'll explain what we mean. And when we are talking about decentralization, what kind of decentralization? It's what Europe needs and Greece as a case study, functional decentralization. And we will focus on four simple steps. The first one, empower democratic institutions by decentralizing them, allowing local referendums, make them possible to happen, reduce abuse of power, and by this improving the quality of the public workforce in the long term, because the decisions will be made for, you know, for some people, for more people. Second step, decentralizing the economic and political power, decentralizing fiscal control, reducing corruption, reducing the power of the trade unions, and have better transparency and easier to do business. When you will not have all the political and economic power in Athens, it will not be the same for the trade unions to control and to demonstrate and to do strikes. It will not be very important. What we mean by decentralizing fiscal control, I will explain it on the third one. Decentralizing the tax system, which will cause lower bureaucracy and less tax evasion. Why? By decentralizing the tax system, we mean that some local authorities will, are, will be responsible to gather the taxes and also will keep these taxes. So let's think an example. We are in Mykonos, the richest island of the Aegean. And we know local businessmen and local authorities do not care about gathering taxes or paying taxes because they know that these taxes go to the government of Athens to repay debts to use them for an inefficient public sector, so they don't see what's the point for that. But if you say to them, you keep the taxes, you use them, you can do whatever you want with them, they will think that we can invest those money to public infrastructure, to healthcare, to education for our children. So. When you change the motive, the behavior of tax evasion changes the next day that you apply that. So we think that decentralizing the tax system and of course the fiscal control is very important. The fourth one, promote decentralization by renewing the political system. Make constitutions stronger, more flexible, more functional, and this promotes faster rule of law. Because changing the constitution uh, in most countries will have a huge impact on how rule of law will be implemented. Is it faster or slower? 
In Greece, that is very important. Only decentralization? No. Of course not. <laughs> because some policy decisions need to remain central or even become international or become more central, like in ancient Greece. You remember from history that we had Athens and Sparta fighting sometimes, being enemies. But every time that the Persians invaded Greece, every single time, they were one, united. Every time. So, which policy making needs to become more central? In the EU level, we need we have a monetary union, so we need to be a better economic union. We need to be, in a certain extent, a better fiscal union, more fiscal. Because since you decide to have a monetary union, to have an economic union, you better do it right. So to be an optimal currency area, you need more economic union and more fiscal union. Common defense policy, common EU foreign and immigration policy needs to become more central. For example, in Greece, military expenses is 3% of the GDP, which is very high. In the 80s and the 90s, where Greece was building a high debt, it was 6%. Greece has 1,300 of tanks, more than uh, double the size that the UK has. So you can ask, why is that? Why they need so much? Why they need to spend so much? Greece is trying to balance Turkey militarily, and this is costly. So if we had a more common defense policy, a more common foreign policy, and maybe a European army, Greece could invest those money, could use this money for public investment, to boost growth, to repay debt faster. So instead of giving billions of euros for military expenses, we could use them more wisely. This is why we need this decision making to be on the EU level and to be central. We cannot do it ourselves, like in ancient Greece. Athens, Sparta, all the Greek cities, they were together. But this is not the case in today's Europe. If Turkey invades Greece, if we have a war in another area, Ukraine, Baltic states, Europe will most probably do nothing. On the national level, we have privatizations, labor markets, pension system, and the downsize of the national public sector. We think that this should be central and national. You cannot ask Catalans or the city of Thessaloniki what pension system they like. And you cannot uh, reform by which uh, area preferences are. But why also to become and remain national? In Europe, we have different types of capitalism. So we need different types of responses to reforms. We don't say to other countries we need reform and to others, no. We say different responses and different kind of reforms. So the question is to finish, will Europe follow more decentralization? It's a very difficult question to answer, but let me finish with my personal view. I think that Greece has a lot of issues to solve, all these that we mentioned, all these difficult issues. And Greece is not trying hard to solve them fast. All these issues. Where are the philosophers to discuss them? Where is the dialogue? I live in Athens, and I can tell you for sure that this dialogue isn't happening. 
they're not talking about these issues. These issues that can change the world, can change Europe, can change Greece, change economics, create hope to Greeks, can only be resolved when you bring together scientists and people who understand the difficulty of government. And if we do not do this dialogue, the failure of doing nothing will not be measured in job losses, in numbers, in lives destroyed, in billions of euros paid in debt. The cost of doing nothing will be measured only in the destruction of the European idea. I hear a lot of people saying, I know more stuff about Greece than my own country. I hear all the time about Greece. Let them fail, it's a small country. It's not like that. Because the European project was a successful one for decades. It's a European idea. If Greece fails, if Greece doesn't do this dialogue, then European idea will be damaged. European project will look for the first time unsuccessful. And we know that systems do not fail because of numbers, but they fail because people lose their faith, their belief, in the ideas that support these systems. We saw that in Soviet Union. So, if Greece fails, if the dialogue in Greece never happens, then the European idea will be damaged and the European project will be a successful one. But we are not there yet. We still have time, so let's think the positive scenario. If Greece succeeds, if Greece succeeds and do changes, do reforms, follow this model, decentralize functionally, do also central policy making and get the help from Europe, of course. If Greece succeeds and do that, we will have a shock, a positive shock. If the black ship of Europe becomes the brightest example as it has been in the past, then we will have a revolution, a revolution of ideas. And Europe will follow once again. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Nick, for this uh, thought-provoking and challenging proposal again and these concrete ideas. And I was always relatively negative on Greece, of course, because I saw that Greek people put a lot of heart into the things, but I thought that always the brain was missing a bit. And with you, I see that there is heart and brain. So that I liked very much. We have time for questions. Uh, so please, questions, comments, critical remarks. Yes, please. Uh, thank you a lot for your speech. It was, was really inspiring, especially the end with the positive outlook. Uh, my name is Miro Gonzalez. I'm from the University of Lucerne. And I would like to know your personal opinion about the austerity measures imposed by the supranational institutions on Greece. Do you think uh, these measures uh, are really um, bound to a positive outcome, such as cutting down the, the pensions or reducing the, the, the pensions or the like sl uh, slimming down the, the public sector, or do you think it would just need more time just to give Greece a break and just to let Greece uh, find its way back to growth and then maybe with time they can repay their debt? Thank you. Austerity packages. Yeah. Uh, first, not all the bailout programs are the same. We had the first one and the second one, and they were almost balanced. We had like 60% taxes, 40% reforms. The last one, the third one, was approximately 88 to 92, depends on the targets, fiscal targets, taxes and 8% reforms. So, when we talk about austerity packages, if we have a balanced bailout program and we try to do the reforms fast to gain growth, to boost growth, to make the economy more competitive, 
then the taxes will not slow down the economy. But when you have a radical left government putting 92% of the bailout program on taxes and 8% only on reforms, privatizations, then you cannot work. So I'm not optimistic about the last one, neither so much for the previous ones, because we voted for reforms, privatizations, but the problem was that we didn't do them. We didn't implement reforms. So you have other countries like Portugal, Cyprus. Portugal is outside austerity packages. Cyprus is about to do so. Cyprus entered 2013. They will exit 2016. And Greece has a third one now. So the problem is that the good part of the bailout programs, the reforms, we don't do them. And we don't do them fast. So if we do fast the reforms, then the slowdown of taxes and austerity is not very bad. But I want to mention that it was a, not an organized, a very well organized plan, all the bailout programs. And uh, they were not fueled with justice. There was no justice inside. Because as I, as I mentioned, the people who pay taxes are the people who cannot avoid them in Greece. So that's the answer. Thank you. We have, other, we have numerous other questions. Uh, so he, here the next one, please. Yeah. Uh, could you hold up your hands so that I can quickly see uh, how much? Will Greece ever be able to pay all the debts back? And if yes, how could that work? And if no, what could be the in institutional solution to not paying back the debt? Some people uh, focus on the size of the debt. They say, look, it's 180%. That's true. Before it was 100, 180, depending the year. But we didn't see the interest rates. Before we had a, a debt approximately with average 3.5 interest rate. Now we have a debt of 1.4% average interest rate. So now we have 80% higher debt as a percentage of the, uh, GDP, 180%, and we pay less for this debt than we paid before. So the markets know that. The problem is that there is need to be a change because this will be until 2021, 2025. Before we paid 12 billion on debt, now we pay only six. But after 2025, it will skyrocket. Maybe 20 billion, 25 billion. They supposed um, that the debt will go down as a percentage because we will have very fast growth, but it needs uh, not a haircut, but a, a decrease in the interest rate, maybe, in the long term. It's difficult to do so because you will say to Slovakia, hey, you get money from the markets. You receive loans with 3%, but you lend money to Greece with 1%. And Greece asks less. So it's very difficult for people in Slovakia to accept this. And also, at the same time, if they do not see a Greek government doing reforms, doing changes, changing all the things that doesn't work in Greece. So, so what, you, what you say in short words is it's not necessarily the level, it's, but it's rather that you know that you have enough taxes uh, that you can pay back. It, it, can pay it back because mm. Japan has even higher debts. It's not a problem the, for now, rates, but after 2020, it will be a huge problem. Okay. Next question, please. Thank you. Yeah, I fully agree with you that uh, in order for Europe to flourish, we need to have more decentralization as we, than we have today. 
This is important because the world becomes more and more interdependent and complex and uh, therefore centralized solutions are limited in scope and efficiency. Uh, the resources are local, uh, the problems are local, so we need to mobilize local knowledge and that requires participatory opportunities. But what is really important is that Europe turns its diversity into an advantage. And I think that requires some degree of the decentralization more than we have today. Thank you very much for that remark. We have other questions uh, over there. Yes, at the end. Just to, to follow the Helbling, um, decentralization is key and the, the ancient Greek may be a model for it, but uh, just to remind you there have been other models in European history like the Hanse in Northern Europe or like the, the city-states of Northern Italy. Mm -hmm. So there's not just mm -hmm. only ancient Greek that can be a role model for decentralization, but there's some more mm -hmm. of that. And the other uh, question is about the checks and balances that you have on the local level. Because I, well, I lived for 10 years in, a, in the town of Marbella in Spain, and in the, uh, this time uh, it was turned to more or less the capital of uh, mafia in Europe, and it was a very strong mayor, and he just did everything he could do against um, the national, le national level. He didn't pay social security for the um, city servants, uh, he built 30,000 30, illegal uh, apartments and the place that was earmarked for the first uh, train station in Marbella was, well, was big apartment blocks. So Marbella is still the biggest uh, st uh, city in Spain without, uh, without, um, without train. So it took about 15 years to, to get rid of him. And so that's a problem that you can have if you if you put too many focus, too much focus on the local level. What to do? Can you repeat the first one? The, what if you put too much focus on the local level, you may run a certain risk uh, that the local level degenerates. Uh, but of course, that can happen at the national level too. But what can we do oh, no, to control about the local? The Italian city states. Well, there have been first, the, the Italian city states. Yes, yeah. There have been the Italian citizens like uh, Milan, uh, uh, Venice, and so on, Genova. that were a strong power when there was no uh, state of Italy mm -hmm. in the, from the 10th or 16th century. And as well, the, um, the Hanse in Northern Europe from the 12th to 16th century as well. And they were merchants that organized themselves when there was no central uh, authority in Germany. Uh, you are right about the Italian city-states, but did they cooperate on the central policy making that we mentioned of... Uh, uh, defense, like the ancient Greek city-states? Yeah. When the Germans came in the 1200s, they fought against the Germans, and, and the Hanse even um, had their own wars against Denmark or against Sweden. So they were more or less effective, and they won these wars. They were more or less effective in defense. But of course, when we talk about you know, ancient Greece, that's more inspiring for Greece, you know, <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. Uh, so, about the second, who tells you that it will not be possible to happen if we have a more central level? I mean, we had the same example in Greece, and uh, on the local uh, perspective, you have this risk. Someone that do, uh, does all these mistakes, and you try to get rid of him, but nobody guarantees that you will not have this on central policy making. Maybe it's worse because it affects the whole country, not just a small region of the country. Very well, yeah. thank you. Uh, Gert, please. Thank you for your, your uh, very interesting uh, lecture and the comparison to uh, the ancient Greece. I, I, Understand that that you are proud of ancient Greek, but and we we, we would we would uh, lack everything without Euclid. But uh, <laughs> Euclid was living in Egypt, 
So uh, the, I think the focus and the perspective of ancient Greece was the was the Mediterranean Sea. So in a, in a, in a complete different different perspective than it than it is today. Uh, and so, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on a, on a, on a society where only 10% of the people were allowed to vote, and that, that had a complete different perspective on, the, on their on their economic imperium uh, than it is than it is today? And uh, so that I better understand why you why you choose ancient Greek as a as a model, or is it a simply an idealistic uh, one? I don't remember the percentage, it, it, it's true, it was very low, but in other countries, what was the percentage that they were voting? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> zero? No, maybe, maybe zero, but I don't take them as well. <laughs> but when we make a comparison, we think the context of the time we are comparing. Yeah. We took the decentralized policy making and the central policy making. We were talking about defense. And uh, in the decentralized, about the Greek city states of those times. And uh, I tried to, to focus on the comparison of security, foreign policy, and the policy making that was so decentralized. Of course, there are huge differences uh, for today's Greece. Huge ones, but we need to make some comparisons. We need to inspire a model. As I told you before, yeah, you need ideas. So if you cause this revolution of ideas, ancient Greece is inspiring Greeks and most of Europeans. So if you cause this inspiration, ideas can change you know, how we perceive economics and we have more hope for the future. Thank you, very good. Uh, we, had, uh, we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Vincent? It's a question I always wanted to ask. Um, so the Greece for me is a little bit like my little cousin because he has a conflictual relationship with his family, yet he depends on them financially. Uh, he hasn't had uh, finished his education in a proper way. He's been trying several jobs, so he's in a kind of a messy situation. And he comes up all the times when we have discussions, right? So it's, and, and the thing for me is, how do I relate to his situation? Huh? So I try not to be judgmental, so he's in a bad situation. There's several reasons for that. But what we do now, the approach is we will let him work it out. So he's in a couple of troublesome years, he'll do his experiences, he'll work it out, right? So we, we start to talk less about it and we, we let him do his thing. And, and then eventually we hope in a couple of years, you know, providing some guidance, he'll be able to figure it out for himself. And so now what, what I'm wondering, uh, yesterday David already asked a question about institutions that would help implement the change in Greece. And, and so um, my question would be the people behind this institution, the Greek society, what is your assessment? How, you know, how can we not be judgmental about what's happening and this society not figuring out how to, um, kind of how to rally around something to get back on track, right? Uh, we had this discussion a bit yesterday evening about uh, Swiss people uh, implementing re regulation much more thoroughly than other uh, countries, right, like France. And, and so there is a difference between the way uh, uh, societies work together. So I know it's a very broad question, but I just wanted from a Greek to have a, a take on it. What do you think is needed for, for this society to find a, a common place to, to get to the right place, right? To come to the example of your little cousin, uh, I guess that a family is responsible for its members, so you protect your little cousin. Uh, where was Europe when Greece had 6% of military expenses uh, in terms of GDP to protect uh, its territory? And uh, Europe was watching when Greece was building high debt also the, the previous decade. Why? They have no problem with that. As long as 
it's military coming from France or Germany. And industry is making money. So you need to see the perspective of Europe and its responsibilities in the past. Because now we forget the responsibilities. If your child has a problem, maybe you're responsible too, the family. But to come to the second part, how society is um, in Greece. Uh, we had more than 26% loss of GDP. The worst crisis ever, worse than the US crisis of the 30s. And people have their lives destroyed. They lose hope. They do not have something to lose. They do not believe in democracy. Do not expect them to think rationally. And when society is not thinking rationally, will not choose the best leaders, the best elites, political, economic elites. So then you have a double problem. Because if the elite will not be the best, or a, a good one at least, and uh, then how the society and the economy can work. So here, the responsibility of Europe comes again, because they need to press, you know, to, to support the governments that do reforms, understand that it's difficult for a Greek society. They are talking like they are talking in a crowd that <coughs> lives in a normal country. They forget that. These people have lost everything, some of them. If you want to think how Soible, how a lot of ministers should talk you know, when they respond to questions from Greeks, they should think that we're talking in the Germany crowd of the 30s and of the 20s. We are not speaking to our country speaking rationally about reforms, about changes, people are not willing to understand. So the bad thing is that Greeks, because we have made a lot of mistakes, one of them is that Greeks uh, thought that, uh, especially the politicians, hey, let's use Europe and European Union to say that everything is Europe. Uh, it's a Europe's uh, problem. It's not our problem. So when they wanted to do a reform, they didn't say, we want to do the reform for our country to improve Greece. They said, it's Europe who says that. I'm a good guy. I don't want to implement reforms. I don't want to, to boost growth to do this stuff. I do not want uh, to, you know, to discuss about these issues. So they used European Union as a scapegoat, the elites, and this made Greek society to hate Europe. And in 2008, Greeks were among the first in favor of you know, the European idea, of the European Union. So in seven years, you cannot have such a change. So something went wrong. And the political and economic elite in Greece did a lot of mistakes. And this was the most important, okay. that they convinced the society that it shouldn't do the reforms. So a lot is about political economy. Uh, I think uh, I would suggest that we s stop here now. You have, of course, time to ask further questions to either Nick uh, or Oana afterwards. Uh, and perhaps it would be a good idea if the prime minister would be calling you too for some concrete proposals, perhaps, uh, during the pause. I suggest that we reconvene here at half past 10, please. Uh, so let's have a coffee. Thank you very much indeed.